Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the New York Foreign Press Center's briefing with the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and our U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield. We're honored to have them both virtually with us today. My name is Melissa Wahibi. I'm the Deputy Director of the New York Foreign Press Center, and I'll be the moderator of today's briefing. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield and Secretary Blinken will offer opening remarks, and then I will moderate the Q&A portion of this event. Thank you for indicating that you had a question as you logged in. We selected several of you and already moved you to the panelist section of Zoom. If you're chosen to ask your question, please wait until I call on you, and at that point, you can turn on your camera and activate your microphone. This event is on the record, and transcription of the briefing will be posted on our website after it concludes. So with that, I offer the virtual floor to you, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield. Thank you so much for being here. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melissa. It really is a pleasure for me to be here with the members of the New York Foreign Press Center and our UN correspondents and to welcome Secretary Blinken, albeit virtually, yeah. to New York City. Uh, when we, uh, when he nominated me as ambassador, President Biden asked me to represent the United States at the United Nations by re-engaging with the world, restoring our alliances and our partnerships and leading by example. And to do all that while keeping American principles and the American people at the center of our foreign policy agenda. Since I arrived one month ago, and I will stress that again, it has only been one month. Uh, we have wasted no time in putting that vision into action. I was pleased to take my fellow Security Council representatives on a virtual visit to the White House to hear firsthand from President Biden. He told them about the importance he places on working with global partners and through multilateral institutions, whether to end the pandemic, improve global health security, or ensure our nation's drive an equitable and sustainable economic economy. And I was also proud to co-lead with Vice President Harris, a historically diverse delegation to the Commission on the Status of Women. This was the first time the United States has been represented at the White House level at a CSW. And it was the first time public members of our delegation truly included women and girls in all their diversity. The Biden-Harris administration is making both gender and racial equity a top priority and central to our strategy. On International uh, Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, I shared, shared my personal story as a person of African descent and the descendant of slaves. And I called on all member states to expose the racism and racial discrimination endemic in every society around the world. We used our signature event during the United States presidency of the Security Council to shine a spotlight on the urgent issue of conflict-driven hunger. And in our modern era, hunger is man-made. Uh, it's, it's, it causes tens of millions of real people to suffer each day. Compassionate humanitarian diplomacy can save lives, and that's what we're about. That same compassionate impulse is why the secretary chaired this morning, this morning's uh, Security Council meeting on the humanitarian situation in Syria. This continues a trend you can expect to see from us at the UN, placing humanitarian issues at the forefront of our engagement. It's why I will be representing the United States tomorrow at the fifth Brussels conference on supporting the future of Syria and the region. The United States is the world's most important forum for bringing people, sorry, the United Nations is the most important forum for bringing people and countries together. And President Biden believes that uh, to his core, and I believe that as well. And I know Secretary Blinken does, uh, does too. I feel very fortunate to be working in partnership with Secretary Blinken, who I know to be a passionate advocate for the world's most vulnerable. Uh, if you heard his speech today where he referred to his children, I have to tell you, Tony, it brought tears to our eyes because we all think about how the impact of these situations that we know thousands of people millions of people around the world are going through how they would impact us and, and our families directly. Together and with the rest of the wonderfully diverse cabinet President Biden has assembled, we're working to build a more secure, peaceful, and compassionate world. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Secretary Blinken to you in his official New York debut, <laughs> uh, to share his thoughts on his meetings today and the ways we're engaging our partners and allies around the world. Mr. Secretary, over to you. 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it has been a packed day at the UN, even virtually. And uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. But more to the point, thank you for the extraordinary uh, leadership you've shown uh, every day since you've gotten there. Uh, we are so fortunate to have Linda Thomas Greenfield as our ambassador uh, to the United Nations. 35 years of experience uh, as a diplomat, uh, bringing all of that experience to this role. Um, I know, uh, Linda, you understand uh, to uh, your core, as you've said, that effective diplomacy is rooted in the power of compassion and kindness in building human relationships, uh, including with people uh, with whom we may not see uh, eye to eye. And I just can't imagine a more capable champion of uh, America's interests and our values. So we're, we're so pleased to have you representing the United States at the United Nations. A fundamental priority uh, of the Biden-Harris administration and of the State Department in which Ambassador Thomas Greenfield and I have the privilege of serving is ensuring that our foreign policy delivers for the American people. Uh, we are always better able to do that when we engage fully in multilateral institutions, whether that's at the UN Security Council or the UN Human Rights Council, in NATO or the World Health Organization. Not because we think these institutions are perfect, but rather because we know that when America doesn't engage, one of two things uh, is likely to happen. Uh, either, either others will step up to fill the void, including those who may not share uh, our interests or values, or no one steps up, leaving only chaos. Either way, that's not good uh, for our own citizens, and I would argue it's not good for people around the world. We also know that we're better able to advance the interests and values of the American people when we confront tough challenges with allies and partners. Um, the, the, the basic fact of life that we uh, have to, uh, I think, all understand and, uh, and acknowledge is that when you think about virtually all of the challenges that we have to deal with, the ones that affect our citizens every single day, not a single one can be dealt with effectively by any one nation acting alone, even the United States. And we also have to join together uh, to defend the rules-based international order, which is essential to our shared security and prosperity. There has to be a system uh, that regulates how countries interact, how nations relate to one another. And that rules-based order is the one that over the last 75 years has created an environment that has prevented uh, wars between uh, the great powers and that has created an open, predictable system in which other countries could emerge and millions could be lifted out of poverty. Um, that's a message I brought directly to our allies over recent weeks in visits to Japan and South Korea with Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, in my visits last week uh, to NATO and the European Union. It's uh, also a message that I shared with Secretary General Guterres and President Bouskir of the United Nations General Assembly in our meetings a, a little bit earlier today. Uh, as you all know, the United States holds the presidency at the Security Council this month. And today I had the opportunity to chair a session on the humanitarian crisis in Syria, as Ambassador Thomas Greenfield uh, referred to. 10 years since the grassroots uprising against the Assad regime, that crisis is more dire than ever. An estimated 13.4 million people, two in every three Syrians, are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance. 60% of Syrians are at serious risk of going hungry. And of course, we see these numbers, we hear these numbers, and we have to remember that behind every number is a human being, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter. Uh, and if we lose sight of this human dimension, then we will all be lost. Uh, the message I brought to the Security Council is that while many of the challenges it grapples with are complex, getting vital humanitarian aid to millions of Syrians shouldn't be. Uh, the Council has a responsibility to ensure Syria's basic needs are met. To that end, uh, the Council should reauthorize all three border crossings for humanitarian assistance, including two it's unconscionably allowed to close. Security Council members should stop taking part in or making excuses for attacks that close these pathways, uh, and they should stop targeting humanitarian workers and Syrian civilians. And Council members should stop making humanitarian assistance a political issue. I hope the Council will act swiftly because the lives of millions of Syrians depend on it. With that, uh, we're happy to take some questions. Thank you, Ambassador and Mr. Secretary for those remarks. We'll now transition to the question and answer portion of today's briefing. Our first question goes to Shi Hengzhong from Chosun Ilbo, Korea. 
Ms. Chong, at this time, you may activate your microphone. And yes, thank you, opening your camera. Go ahead, you may ask your question. Hello, my name is Shi Heng Jong from Joseon Ilbo Daily Newspaper of the Republic of Korea. Thank you for having us today. My first question is on North Korea. Do you think there are still room for starting conversation, negotiation for denuclearization and human rights progress of North Korea, while its only response is just a few missile launches and verbal attacks as of now? What do you think the most important difference between President Biden's access to North Korea and that of Trump administration? And secondly, what is your expectation, your expectation for it? Asian allies like Korea and Japan in tackling China's human rights issues and its rule breaking behaviors like blame its neighbors in terms of history distortion, military expansion, and un unfair trade practices. Do you think the Korean government is a reliable ally who is which is on the same page with this with the state? Great. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to kick it off. Well, let me just say to put this in context a little bit, um, I returned uh, just a short while ago from a trip to the Indo-Pacific, uh, met with uh, our counterparts in, in Japan uh, and South Korea, uh, and North Korea was a primary topic of, of conversation in, in both countries. And we also discussed it with our Chinese counterparts in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, a couple of days later. And this is one of those areas where uh, I think we have at least some alignment of interest with, uh, with Beijing. Uh, following uh, that trip, uh, the national security advisors of uh, Japan and South Korea will be in Washington to meet with Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor. Uh, we know how important coordination is among uh, the United States, uh, South Korea, and Japan when it comes to North Korea, and we're gratified to have the opportunity to um, advance trilateral cooperation. As I think you know, um, we're in the, uh, in the midst of reviewing our policy and approach uh, to North Korea. And the conversations that we had with our uh, allies and partners were very important in helping to inform uh, that review. So I took a lot of what I heard uh, back to Washington uh, to share with the president, to share with my, uh, my colleagues. Uh, the review is coming to conclusion, and we very much look forward to uh, discussing it with our allies uh, and implementing it in very close uh, coordination with them. Um, we know as a matter of general principle that we are much better positioned to take on any challenge when we do so in concert with our allies. That certainly uh, applies to, uh, to North Korea. Um, we've of course had recent provocations uh, and uh, we've condemned them. Uh, these destabilizing ballistic missile launches um, are um, uh, subject to our condemnation and those of allies and partners, uh, including in the UN system, but because they violate multiple UN Security Council resolutions and threaten the region and the broader international community. Um, our commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea and Japan is, uh, is ironclad. What we see from these unlawful uh, nuclear and ballistic uh, missile uh, programs is a serious threat to international peace and security and something that undermines as well the global nonproliferation regime in which we all have a strong interest. And I think that uh, the United States, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan uh, are united in uh, our um, uh, commitment uh, to standing up against these provocations and advancing uh, the denuclearization uh, of the peninsula. Uh, most important, I would just say that uh, what we're seeing from Pyongyang in terms of these provocations does nothing uh, to shake the resolve of our three countries, along with uh, allies and partners around the world, to uh, approach North Korea from a position of strength in order to diminish the threat that it poses to, uh, to the region and beyond. That's exactly what we're doing. And again, we'll have more when we complete, uh, complete our review and are able to share it. Linda, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I would just briefly add that we've engaged on this here in New York as well. We consulted with both our Japanese and, and South Korean uh, counterparts on, uh, on the way forward. Uh, we held a committee meeting of the 718 uh, committee on, on sanctions, and we're looking at uh, additional actions that we might take here in New York. Thank you very much. Our second question goes to Paolo Mester Lilly from La Stampa, Italy. Paolo, you may turn on your camera and your microphone. 
Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for uh, the briefing. Uh, in Brussels, you say that the United States will not force the Allies into a choice between us and them uh, in terms of uh, the relationship with China. However, there are several European countries that are developing strong commercial relationship with China, including Italy, that joined the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Is being part of the Belt and Road Initiative compatible with the new strategy of NATO and uh, the US toward China? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, let me first say that I think uh, that our relationship uh, with Beijing, and I think this also reflects the relationship that many of our allies and partners have with Beijing, is um, competitive uh, in some places, uh, it's uh, collaborative uh, in other places, and it's adversarial uh, in still others. Um, but there's a common denominator, whether the relationship is uh, adversarial, whether it's competitive, whether it's cooperative, and the common denominator is the need to engage uh, China uh, from a position uh, of strength. And that position of strength starts with um, strong alliances and partnerships, with collaboration and coordination. You're right that uh, the United States uh, won't uh, force our allies to, to choose between the United States and China. And that's for a simple reason. Um, first, this is not about um, containing China or, or keeping China down. It's about holding up the international rules-based system that all of us have invested so much into over the last uh, 75 years. And it has served our interests and our values very well, just whatever its imperfections. And so when anyone challenges that system, uh, when anyone, whether it's China or any other country, uh, doesn't play by the rules or tries to undermine uh, the, uh, the rules and commitments that, that everyone has made, uh, we all have reason to stand up for that, uh, to stand up against that, uh, and uh, to stand up for the system that we've invested in. So that's what this is about. It is about defending, uh, preserving, and strengthening uh, the rules-based order. And when we see China taking actions, uh, the government in Beijing taking actions, that undermine that order, uh, whether it's uh, by violations of human rights, which uh, are violations of international commitments in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, uh, or other solemn commitments that uh, the government in Beijing has made, then uh, we, we come together, we speak out, uh, we act together uh, in, um, uh, in support of that, uh, of that order. Um, and I think what, what's also very important is that we know that our allies uh, have complex relationships with China uh, that won't always align uh, perfectly. Uh, and just as we uh, may have uh, areas that are ripe for cooperation with, uh, with China, so too do uh, some of our allies. And uh, we recognize that, but we also, I think, um, uh, see the need uh, to navigate uh, these challenges together. Uh, and that means working with our allies to close gaps in areas where Beijing is trying to drive us apart. And I think that was really uh, uh, a very important aspect of uh, the, the trips that I've taken recently, the conversations I've had uh, with close allies and partners in Asia, as well uh, as in Europe. Thank you. Our next question goes to Carolina Cimenti from Global Brazil. Ms. Cimenti, you may now ask your question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for having us for this conversation. Well, I imagine that at this point, you know that the foreign minister of Brazil has resigned today. And so I'd like to ask you about the US and the Brazil relation. And what is your view of the current government of Bolson President Bolsonaro's uh, foreign policy? And also I would like to add another question if has the Brazilian government requested to buy the surplus doses of vaccines from the US? Uh, thank you very much. Well, let me, let me speak generally to the, the relationship and the, uh, and the partnership because I think it's very, very important. And um, it's important ultimately to both of our countries and to people in both the United States and Brazil for a whole uh, host of reasons. Uh, it's also important, I would argue, for uh, people throughout the region 
Um, and indeed, in many ways, uh, on a global scale, especially when we consider things like, uh, uh, like climate change. But, but fundamentally, um, there is uh, what unites the United States and Brazil uh, fundamentally is a shared commitment to democratic values uh, that spans both of our countries. Um, as I see it, as we see it, as President Biden sees it, partnering with Brazil uh, is critical to effectively tackling the shared global challenge of climate change, the existential challenge of our time. Uh, we also share, uh, as you know, um, a remarkable bilateral economic uh, relationship. It's valued right now at more than $100 billion. Uh, we're proud to be uh, Brazil's largest uh, trading partner in value-added goods. And that's a partnership that, when you think about it practically, is supporting thousands of jobs, many thousands of jobs in, in both our countries. Um, we've done good work, I think, in, uh, in recent months uh, to further strengthen the partnership. Uh, last year, we updated our agreement on trade and economic cooperation. Uh, that's important. Uh, we're uh, by far the largest investor uh, in Brazil, including, uh, I think this is significant, in many of Brazil's most innovative uh, and uh, growth-focused uh, companies. We've got a strong track record of, uh, of job creation in Brazil with a focus on these growth sectors and high-value uh, employment. Uh, collaboration with the Brazilian government uh, and uh, American and Brazilian companies uh, under uh, the CEO forum uh, that you may know about that's actually been in place for uh, about almost 15 years. That's continuing to strengthen the bilateral trade and investment relationship and particularly by increasing private sector participation in commercial and trade policy. We have an energy forum uh, established um, back in 2019 that is also strengthening uh, both commercial and technological partnerships with Brazil and the energy sector. Uh, there are a series of other uh, agreements that uh, really help to shape the cooperation and collaboration uh, that we're doing. So uh, I say all this because I think it's important for people to remember that uh, we have a partnership that's engaged together in tackling global challenges and a partnership that's making a difference uh, every single day in the lives uh, of our citizens. Uh, when it comes to COVID-19, uh, let me just say a couple of things as well. Uh, as you know, one of the first things that we did uh, in coming into office was to rejoin the World Health Organization. And, uh, yeah, and that's vitally important for helping to deal with COVID-19 now, as well as setting up a stronger global health security system going forward so that we can help uh, prevent or, if necessary, mitigate the next pandemic. We've contributed $2 billion dollars. Uh, to COVAX to make access to vaccines um, uh, greater around the world with another $2 billion uh, committed between now and 2022 as other nations increase their own commitments. Uh, we, uh, as you may have seen, have an arrangement with uh, Japan, Australia, and India together uh, where we will make uh, uh, access to vaccines uh, over, over time even greater around the world. And finally, uh, we started to make some contributions to our nearest neighbors in, uh, in Mexico and in Canada uh, with vaccines. I anticipate that as um, we continue to uh, vaccinate the entire uh, American population, uh, that uh, we will be able to do even more uh, around the world. And in the months ahead and, uh, and over time, the United States, uh, I'm convinced, will be the leader in advancing uh, access to vaccines around the world. Thank you. Um, due to time, this next question will be our final question. It goes to Lionel Gendron from RTL France. Lionel, you may turn on your camera and mic. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. The United States has been out of the Paris Agreement during four years. In Europe, especially in France, some say they need a boost from the USA in the fight against uh, global warming. How do you plan to catch up the delay and to give this boost expected by partners? Well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. And I think um, the answer, I, I hope at least, is already uh, apparent in the sense that um, we quite literally hit the ground running uh, on climate. On day one, of course, we rejoined the, uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, the president uh, issued immediately an executive order uh, to ensure that, uh, that climate is a core national security and foreign policy priority. Uh, so I'm working under those instructions. He commissioned uh, a national intelligence estimate to help us understand the scope of the climate threat. Uh, he directed uh, the department uh, that he entrusted me with, the State Department, as well as other US agencies uh, to integrate climate considerations 
into everything we do, into our planning, into our operations, uh, into our um, uh, policy. Um, it's also why uh, he appointed John Kerry as special presidential envoy for climate. Um, John has been incredibly busy uh, talking with, uh, working with world leaders on the subject. Uh, but I've got to tell you, he's not alone in this effort. Um, I raise uh, the issue in virtually every conversation I have uh, with my counterparts, and it's been a focus of the president's engagements as well. Um, we know how high the stakes are, and we know that this year in particular uh, is critical. Uh, Gina McCarthy, the president's national climate advisor and her team, are preparing our new emissions target under the Paris Agreement. Uh, and we plan to announce it, uh, the new nationally determined contribution, uh, in April, probably coincident with the Leaders' Summit that President Biden has convened on Earth Day on April 22nd. That's going to be a very important um, milestone on the way to COP26 in Glasgow uh, toward the end of the year. Uh, we've invited 40 world leaders uh, to, to join us uh, for that, uh, that summit, April 22nd and April 23rd. And th the major purpose of it is to really rally the major uh, economies uh, of the world and other key stakeholders to raise our collective ambition, uh, to raise our sights, uh, and to set the global community up for success in the coming months and years. And as I said, that will be an important marker on the road to, to COP26. I think, you know, above all else, um, if you ask around the world, uh, we're showing up again. Uh, we're listening to our partners. We're recommitting the U.S. government uh, to this issue across the board. And it, it isn't a narrow band uh, priority for the administration. It really goes to the heart uh, of our effort to build a safer and more prosperous world. Um, ultimately, we, we, we strongly believe as well, and this is important, that by addressing the climate crisis, the United States also can revitalize our economy, uh, create millions of good jobs, and build sustainable infrastructure. Um, this really is, and as the president sees it, has to be a whole of government approach to put us on an irreversible path uh, to net zero emissions by, by 2050. So uh, I think our partners uh, are, are, are seeing that uh, around the world. Um, it is at the heart of, uh, of our foreign policy. And uh, I feel very positive about the fact that we have been able uh, to jumpstart uh, American re-engagement uh, on climate. And we have to and we will use this critical year uh, to make real progress. Thank you, Leonel. And uh, I want to thank all the journalists for your participation today. And a special thank you to Secretary Blinken and Ambassador Thomas Greenfield for your time addressing members of the Foreign Press Center. Transcription and video of this uh, event will be uploaded shortly. And with that, this concludes today's briefing. Thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you.